Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. And uh, thanks in particular to Dr. Pollard who prepared the background for my talk too. So I'd like to talk today about a family of genes that perhaps assists in making us human. And it all relates to signaling through acetylcholine just because that's the only window that we know a little bit about. And the family of genes are uh, microRNAs, which uh, sort of wrap around the target genes to block their expression. So other, un unlike previous talks, I'm not talking about genes that do something of their own. They rather prevent other genes from doing their job. And I'll talk about that in connection with signaling through the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the brain and periphery. And I'd like to mention the relevance of this to networks of activity in our nervous system, to the timeline of experiments. How long does it take a microRNA to work? and to the personalized aspects of changes in such microRNAs. And I'd like to do that by paying virtue to our PhD students who actually do the work and uh, m make us the scientists we are. So this started by our interest in microRNAs. So we keep talking about DNA that gets transcribed to RNA, that gets translated to protein, and microRNAs block this part of the path. So rather than doing whatever other genes do, they prevent other genes from doing their job, and they can do that to many genes based on a very small sequence motif. So one microRNA can block a pathway, a biological reaction. And this story starts with a question that I posed in a lab meeting, and Shachar Barbas, then an LSEC student and today postdoctoral fellow at the Rockefeller, uh, uh, took the challenge. And the challenge was, how do microRNA genes evolve? They are very, very small. They are a hundredfold smaller than other genes. Changing one nucleotide, one building block, would make a new gene. And the statistical prospects of that to happen are very small because the shorter the sequences are, the lower are the prospects of them being changed. So the question was, how do we make these genes the traffic controllers that they are? And what Shachar said was, I can do this by looking into our genome and searching for those microRNA genes that we have today backward. When did they get inserted into the human genome? And what he's done was to look at the 1,000 Genome Project, which today control, contains many more than 1,000 genomes, and ask what, what did the microRNA genes in our genome look early on, 600 million years ago, just at the beginning of vertebrates. And there are some microRNAs that are in our genome that long, and they are, exist in many copies, and they handle control over very few target genes. Now you see here the color code, so the redder it is, the more diverse it is. Now let's compare those old microRNA genes to those that got into our genome together with vertebrate evolution. They exist in fewer copies, but they take care of more targets, so they acquired more capacities. And many microRNA genes actually developed very short time ago, two and a half million years ago. So with development of the large primates, they exist in very few copies. They are highly conserved, but they handle many, many targets, especially in the brain. So you could tell me, well, the brain expresses many more genes than other tissues in any case, but this is a particular comparison, in particularly interesting comparison to us because look at the association. When the microRNAs are highly conserved, the targets are not. When the microRNAs are less conserved, 
the targets change too. And when they are versatile, then the targets are conserved. So there is an association between the level of conservation of microRNAs and their targets. Otherwise, we would get into an evolutionary, non-survivable species. So that sort of makes sense. Okay, so let's assume that microRNAs help us to be human, to use tools, to come give lectures in ELSEC conferences, etc. How can we study that? We focus on those that associate with acetylcholine signaling, and over the years we've cloned some of the cholinergic genes. We looked at what mutations do to them. So here are brain maps of people who carry a change that changes one of the uh, proteins that hydrolyze acetylcholine, cholinesterases, and they happen to live next to an area that is sprayed with insecticides, which block cholinesterases. And if the cholinesterase genes don't function properly, they would show higher activity in the frontal lobe, lower activity in deep nuclei, and learning and memory impairments. When we found those mutations, that was really exciting, and we also noted changes in regions of those genes that are not encoding protein. And we thought that was junk DNA. That was the textbook word then. But now we know that those regions could be reacting with microRNAs. So now we are looking at differences beyond the coding. Now, beyond the brain, acetylcholine can block inflammatory reactions, which Dr. Habib talked about in the context of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So that was of interesting, uh, interest to us as well. And our uh, European Research Council project has been entitled Cholinomers, microRNA targeting the cholinergic signaling pathway. So one last aspect that I want to mention in terms of introduction is that microRNAs are so small that they are what we call druggable. You can synthesize an inverse sequence, inject it, and block their function. So that gives us a model that is readily available for testing. And I'd like to mention today three snapshots of such microRNA controllers of cholinergic signaling. And the first example has been the focus of the PhD thesis of Uriah Beckenstein in the lab. And it starts in Japan, where in 97, the Japanese TV broadcasted a movie which is part of the Pokemon series and includes five seconds of rapidly flashing lights. It's very unpleasant to watch. It still exists on YouTube, so I watched it. But that movie was taken off TV that night in Japan forever because 800 kids who watched that movie developed epileptic seizures and were hospitalized. So that raised to us three questions. Why did those kids get sick? What happened to the other 20 million Japanese kids who watched this unavoidable movie and didn't get sick? What protects the, our brain from getting epileptic? And why did it take seven hours? They watched the movie in the afternoon. They were hospitalized at night. So I said, this is not sufficient time for a normal gene to get transcribed, translated, transported, make a difference. But microRNAs are hundredfold smaller. They can be produced rapidly. And the watching of that movie is highly memorable. I was lecturing about this work recently in France. There were two Japanese postdocs in the audience, and they approached me later. They said, we watched this. It was really disturbing. So it was a disturbing experience to everyone, but most of us are protected. And the question was, what do we do to study the mechanism? So what Oria did was to start by looking at data sets. Let's find in the web available data sets of all microRNA genes in the brain, of all uh, microRNA genes in synaptosomes, of all microRNA genes that react to a cholinergic excitation of epilepsy, pilocarpine. It's a plant-produced product. You inject it to a mouse, and it develops epilepsy. And there were three microRNAs that crossed all of these data sets. One of those comes from chromosome 15, from an area where geneticists tell us 
If that's microdeleted, we get epileptic seizures. So that was a good, interesting signal. Also, that particular microRNA, by the way, these microRNAs only have n numbers, not names. It targets the acetylcholine receptor alpha-7, which controls inflammation. And epilepsy involves inflammation. So that was interesting, but it was a primate-specific feature. So what we needed to do to find out if it's really relevant was to take cell cultures and express the microRNA and look at the receptor. And we did that in human-specific cells, and indeed, we can see that the receptor for acetylcholine is controlled by this microRNA. Okay, now the next challenge was to create a timeline. Not necessarily of seven hours, but certainly a timeline that we can follow. So what we did was to engineer mice that did not express the transgene as long as we fed them with antibiotics. Now we can grow them up with antibiotics as if they were normal, take the antibiotics off, accumulate the microRNA in their brain, bring it back again, and reduce the levels. And the question was, would reduction change the tendency for epilepsy, for which purpose we inserted electrodes into their brain and recorded the activity? And sure enough, the transgenic mice developed epilepsy. Most of them, and control mice tested the same way, didn't do that. And the timeline was four days, so not seven hours, but perfectly tailored for a long weekend of a PhD student. So we have epileptic seizures, and now we wanted to check what happens when we expose these mice to an epileptogenic agent. We inject them, and sure enough, the transgenics are more susceptible to epilepsy this way as well. Now comes the time to check what happens to those pathways that we know control epilepsy. In addition to acetylcholine, the TGF-beta receptor pathway is involved. And interestingly, TGF-beta receptor is target of the same microRNA. And we can show that its concentration in the brain goes down, and that the timeline is the same four days that we just mentioned. So both cholinergic and TGF-beta receptor genes are involved. And then we did some RNA sequencing. So the transgenic mice grown in the presence of antibiotics show almost no differences. So this is a volcano plot. Anything to the right is higher expression. Anything to the left is lower expression. Very little of that. But as soon as we reduce the level of this microRNA, the hippocampus goes crazy. There's a huge difference in gene expression. And we could find out that those were exactly the genes that we know to be involved in epileptic seizures, especially in the blood-brain barrier domain, which we know is impaired in functioning under epilepsy. But I promised you cholinergic, so the cholinergic genes may go up and down, and we have a lot of variants. So we picked one variant of acetylcholinesterase, which is soluble, and created a transgenic mouse that overexpresses it and has little cholinergic signaling. And that mouse is susceptible to epilepsy under pilocarpine exposure. Not only that, when we expose it, it expresses too little of microRNA-211, our protector, and too much of another microRNA-134, which is known through the work of David Henschel to induce epilepsy. So here is a seesaw. One goes down, one goes up. MicroRNAs do not work on their own. They work in complex interactions. So what happens to the cognition of these mice? And we know that epileptic seizures, when repeated, impair cognitive capacities. We put these mice in a Morris water maze. We ask, how fast can they find a platform? And they cannot. They seem to be stupid. And we follow their learning path, so they both learn slowlier and forget faster. So they get lost, which reminds us of what happens to Alzheimer's disease patients, and 22% of them suffer epilepsy, which today is not really taken care of. So we got some brain tissue from the Netherlands Brain Bank, 
Sure enough, Alzheimer's brains express more of this microRNA, apparently not sufficiently high enough to avoid epilepsy. So this is the first snapshot. To what extent is this a general picture? So Bettina Nadorp in the lab uh, screened all of the literature about microRNAs, uh, deleted everything to do with cancer. We are not interested in that topic. 95% of the papers are. And found and made the following assumptions. Let's agree that microRNAs can target more than one gene in a pathway. Let's accept the definition that cholinergic signaling is a pathway. Therefore, there should be microRNAs that control more than one target in the cholinergic signaling system. And she found 30 like, uh, microRNAs like that, and one third of those were primate specific, namely, we as primates acquired another layer of regulation by developing more microRNA genes to control cholinergic signals. And here is an atomic resolution model of one of those microRNAs, 132, which controls acetylcholine esterase. So the two samples, examples that I want to mention are 132, which is conserved, so it exists from mice to men all the way, and 608, which is primate specific. Okay, so the question we want to ask is the following. Could it be that the stress responding features of cholinergic signaling function at least partially via microRNA regulation? Could it be that the wild man in the desert who was stressed because a lion was running after him was reacting by changing the levels of microRNAs? Could it be that we, who get stressed when, when Donald Trump tweets, right? We get stressed for other reasons altogether, still activate the same machinery and have the same microRNA responses. So that's the evolutionary level question we would like to find out. And microRNA 132 is the first one we studied. It targets acetylcholinesterase, and when it does, it controls the cholinergic signaling level under stressful reactions and avoids cognitive decline. So, okay, while blocking also the changes in inflammation in the periphery. So here is a cross-system relationship MicroRNAs can also go from the brain to the body through packing in little membrane reps, exosomes. So Niba Mishra, a postdoc in the lab, asked the question, can we find microRNAs that prefer one alternative splicing variant over another? How do we do that? So we use the surface plasmon resonance, a little gold leaflet. We bind and mimic synthetic oligonucleotide mimicking the microRNA. We use microfluidic chambers to flow a mimic of the target. If they bind, we'll get resonance and we'll determine dissociation constants. And there is one variant which is soluble and not bound to the synapse, which seems to be bound better to this microRNA. Now that makes sense to us because anything that sits at the synapse it's not a good target for microRNAs because the protein will remain there whatever you do to the RNA. But if that is the case, then we need to check what happens in a live animal, not in a microfluidic chamber. So we inject an antisense agent. So what we do is we inject three milligram per kilo, very little dose, and we check for the level of the microRNA. It goes down in the periphery, not in the brain, this is too big, the oligonucleotide is too big to cross the blood-brain barrier. Then we ask, what happens to the target? And the target is really upregulated so much that we probably view a situation when there is much less acetylcholine. That is a problem. We can't breathe without acetylcholine. Our diaphragm depends on it. So what we asked in the lab was, what happens to the diaphragm? We look at these little bagels. These are the neuromuscular junctions in a mouse diaphragm, and they're labeled for acetylcholine esterase that degrades acetylcholine, 
for the acetylcholine receptor which binds it, or both. And you see both are localized in the same place, and control diaphragms don't light up, so that means the system viewing the situation with too much acetylcholine esterase immediately produces more receptor to rebalance the situation. That's why the mouse stays alive and can breed. And this is after six hours, after 24 hours, the electron microscopy of neuromuscular junctions is perfectly normal. It's the microRNA that rebalances the situation. So then we had a new challenge in our research. How do we create a model where the system will not be able to rebalance? And what we have done was to create a mouse with too much esterase, and we deleted the part that reacts to microRNAs. The microRNA levels go up in that mouse tenfold, but it doesn't help because the target is not there. So this is the way the mouse looks. You know, if you ever saw mice, they run around, but then they sit down. These mice never sit down. They keep running. This is normal speed. They're nervous. If you put them in a maze where there's apple juice at this end, then the normal mouse learns quickly and runs there to get the apple juice, but the engineered mouse goes back and forth. It forgot its glasses. It doesn't know where it left the keys. It's confused. It's stressed, but we didn't stress it. All we did was to impair microRNA response. Now, I told you that this microRNA should also control inflammation. Indeed, these mice show intestinal inflammation like hell. And the next question is, is that relevant to human beings as well? So Shanish and I in the lab collaborated with clinicians who take out the uh, inflamed regions from Crohn's disease patients. And she found an order of magnitude higher level of this microRNA. So this is a microRNA that reacts both to anxiety and to inflammation. Okay. And then another clinician came to talk to me. This is Hanan Meidan, and he screened the literature for anxiety and metabolism. And he found a, a real overlap, including microRNA 132, so I knew that he must be right. So then we thought, let's take the old cartoon. Could it be that the fat man is anxious, not accidentally, that this is for a reason? compared to the thin man who is always happy. Could it be that microRNAs were involved? And if that is the case, then did the anxious people accumulate fat in their liver? So the question, I come from the brand of scientists, you give us a question, we go and engineer a mouse. So I wanted to engineer a mouse with too much of microRNA 132, and I asked Geula Hanin in the lab to do that, and she failed. We injected 74 times. We never got live mice. The embryos were aborted when the brain developed. Too much of this microRNA is not very good for brain development. But Geula is stubborn, so what she's done was to use a collagen promoter, which is hardly expressed in the brain. So now we have a mouse with overexpressed microRNA 132 in all body tissues except for the brain. And she comes to me and she shows me the liver of that mouse, which looks like foie gras, full of vacuoles, positively stained for fat. And you know, I said, this can't be, it must be a mistake. The transgene inserted in an obesity controlling region in the genome. So she made two more lines like that, and they all reacted the same. Too much of this microRNA leads to accumulation of fat in the liver. Triglycerides are very high. The bad cholesterol species, sky high. If these mice would go to their family clinician, they would be reproached. So now the question was, could we prove whether or not this microRNA is causally involved, not just associated? And that we didn't want to do in transgenic mice, which are artificial. Instead, we sent mice to McDonald's for 11 weeks. Or, in other words, we bought very expensive high-fat diet. And the mice doubled their body weight in 16 weeks. The levels of microRNA-132 in their liver go sky high, and we inject them with the antisense agent, and we remove it. 
So now let's look at what happens to their livers. Thanks for Geula's mobile phone. We have very good photographs. And you see here the outcome of one treatment, injecting the tail vein. And as Naomi said before, it all goes to the liver. So the liver shrinks back to its normal size and color and loses the fat staining within one week. And then it goes back. It's a transient treatment. If we re-inject, we repeat the, the results. So yes, microRNA-132 is causally involved in fat accumulation in the liver. And that made us think that, yes, it could have been of value to the wild man in the desert to accumulate fat because there might be days where they couldn't find food. But we still do. And we actually keep a lot of thrifty genes like that, as the James Neal theory said a long time ago. So how come this microRNA is so important? We know how fat is produced. We know the molecules. We know the enzymes. We know the transcription factors that control these enzymes. And microRNA-132 controls all of these transcription factors. So it sits if we inject an antisense agent to this gene, we won't get such an outcome, or this or that. What we see here is a, a regulator that is a master regulator of microRNAs. In other words, all microRNAs are equal, but some microRNAs are more equal than others. Okay. So are there people out there who don't go to McDonald's, accumulate fat for other reasons? Actually, there are. One to 200, up to 500 people worldwide would tend to accumulate fat in their liver without eating improperly. These are the populations that kept inbreeding, like Ashkenazi Jews, for example, unfortunately. So we have 1,500 different mutations in the cholesterol receptor. And we actually bought a mouse without the cholesterol receptor. We treated it with the antisense agent. It lost fat in the liver as well, but thanks to suppression of other sets of genes. So the conclusion here is microRNA-132 is a master regulator, but it's context-dependent as well. And if we put these mice in a metabolic cage, they, transgenics, use fat instead of carbohydrates. If we look at the antisense-treated mice, they improve the use of carbohydrates and lose energy. And Finally, people who carry interruptions in their genome in the regions controlling microRNA's function would accumulate a lot of the target, a lot of the microRNAs, and much less of its other targets. So this, in terms of personalized medicine, would say that changing one microRNA reaction would cause a domino reaction to many, many other genes. And I think I would like to show you one last slide. Okay. Okay. So in the Israeli research system, we belong to a center of excellence studying the reactions to trauma. We recruited 100 uh, volunteers who were ex-war prisoners in 73. And they came back. Most of them suffer PTSD, all of the pink ones. A few of them do not. And then we genotyped their DNA. And what we find is that carriers who came back apparently healthy have much more of that SNP that prevents microRNA interaction. And we are now profiling in exosomes all of the microRNAs in their serum to find out how the message was transferred from brain to body. And here I want to summarize by, okay, by saying this is imperfect. Each of these snapshots is a picture into a situation that is very complex. But as Margaret Atwood said correctly, if I wait for perfection, I'll never write a word. 
So we talked about microRNAs, about complexity, timelines, the cholinergic system, networks, and personalized aspects. And I thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Mona, for this uh, amazing tour from small microRNA into uh, stress response of uh, uh, post-war um, questions. One or two, we are a little bit late, but uh, there were so many aspects to, to this talk, so uh, may, maybe if I can ask a short one. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, that uh, microRNA, which is of course uh, the case, are working in, as groups. Yep. working uh, as a collaborating uh, concert. And for most of what you showed us, you showed a very specific and pretty dramatic event that one will do the job. But as we know, this guy or this uh, specific one has another hundreds of targets probably. So how yeah. can this? Well, it, there are two parts to the answer. One says yes, some microRNAs are master regulators. And evidently, those were the ones that were studied by many, not only by me. But today, we do know that microRNAs work in groups. And as usual, we talk about what we just published, but not what we're writing now. So <laughs> that's what we are doing. That's a good answer. Please. OK. Um, do you know what are the implications of that for people suffering from these disorders and for uh, obesity? Yeah. Okay, so that's a great question. We did look for carriers of this uh, interruption of microRNA function in reaction to stressful insults. That, that is one that I did publish already. And what happens to them is they are more alert, they have a higher blood pressure, they have a higher inflammation and higher anxiety markers in psychological questionnaires but they're not post-traumatized. They are more alert and their prefrontal lobe activity overcomes the amygdala reaction. So that to me said, first, it's good to know because we all carry unfavorable DNA changes. It's good to know that the brain can overcome at least part of those. And the second is, perhaps it's better to train our frontal lobe than take medications to avoid stressful conditions, so. Okay, I think it's a beautiful comment to end up uh, uh, this uh, session. And uh, I want to thank both speakers. Uh, and um, we are, go thank you, thank you, Mona.